The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Welcome to What Catholics Believe. This is another installment of our treatment of the Catechism. Uh, last time we left off about midway through Lesson 29, The Nature of Marriage. And uh, so I read the first nine questions here. I'll pick up on question 10. How many wives did God create for Adam? And the answer is only one wife. God wanted this marriage to be the model for all marriages, one man and one woman. And there we have a quote from the book of Genesis, chapter 2. Wherefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall be two in one flesh. Question 11. How long does God intend husband and wife to stay together? Answer. Until the death of one of the partners. And again we turn to the sacred scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. A woman is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband die, she is at liberty. Let her marry to whom she will, only in the Lord. <clears throat> Number 12, why does God command husband and wife to stay together until death? Because the lifetime welfare of the children and of the married couple themselves requires that they be permanently united. Divine law requires the couple to stay together until death, even if they have no children. In special cases, separation is permitted, but the bond of marriage remains. <clears throat> now, these three questions here talk about the, <clears throat> the indissolubility of the marriage bond, that uh, marriage is between one man and one woman. And in the marriage, even in the natural marriage, um, a fortiori in the marriage of the sacrament, what we call matrimony, it is God who joins the couple together. They express their wills to be united, their choice, their consent to be married. They consent that, uh, they announce that aloud, and uh, it is witnessed. But it is not the couple who actually form the union between them. It is Almighty God who does so. And he holds them, then, to be husband and wife for as long as they both live. And once the marriage is, uh, once their wills are expressed, once their vows are, are made, <clears throat> once they have joined together, then uh, there is no power anywhere that can make them no longer husband and wife as long as they both live. This is what we mean by the fact that the marriage bond is not, dis not dissoluble or not soluble. It cannot be destroyed by anything but death. Now, this permanence of the marriage bond is very important, obviously. It is one of what we call the properties of marriage, as essential attributes, as it were, of the marriage bond, that it lasts as long as both live. Now, the two essential purposes of marriage are, first of all, the begetting of children and the giving of life, and the nurturing of that life. And second of all, the mutual support of the husband and the wife. Even when the children have grown and have left the home, and are supporting themselves, and perhaps raising their own families, the second, the second part of that, the second essential purpose, the mutual support of the husband and wife, always remains as long as they both live. And because that is an essential purpose of their having married in the first place, that essential purpose remains throughout their lifetimes. They are bound to fulfill that, even after they've given life and nurtured that life. Of course, they do not stop being mother and father to their children. And now will they stop being husband and wife to each other as long as they both live. There are those who argue against <coughs> marriages as being uh, 
indissoluble if there are no children, but they uh, have to understand that the begetting of children and the nurturing of children is one of two essential purposes. As I mentioned to you earlier, where you have not only marriage, but you've added also the third purpose, the, the supernatural purpose of expressing the love of, between God and the souls of the redeemed, the souls of the saved in heaven. The love between God and the church, uh, which is a permanent love, which is an everlasting love. So it is with the married spouses. They are meant to help each other to save their souls in a sacramental marriage of matrimony. And so as long as they both live, that purpose will always remain, and so they will always remain husband and wife. As long as they are alive in this world, they must care about and pray for and sacrifice for and labor for not only their own salvation, but each other's salvation as well. Now here we have number 13. What is a valid marriage? Answer, a union that is a real marriage in the eyes of God, and therefore can be broken only by death. There are many putative marriages, that is, the parent marriages. People like to think they can get married <coughs> by making some uh, uh, freelance marriage vows to the wind or to the sun or to the seashore or whatever. But these are not marriages in the eyes of God. Uh, for a marriage to be truly valid, it has to be real in the eyes of God. Otherwise, it's just a mirage, just an, an illusion, or what we call a putative marriage. And so we know what marriages are valid in the eyes of God. We know what requirements are for the, for the expression of the consent, what they have to consent to. And so... Um, there is such a thing as a real and a valid marriage in the eyes of God, but there's a very clear and very strong and real distinction between the valid marriages and the marriages that are invalid, that are null and void from the very beginning. The marriages that are true, valid marriages, when God has joined them together, uh, those marriages can be broken, or I should say the marriage bond between them can be broken only by death itself. No power on earth, therefore, can break a valid marriage. Quote, What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. St. Mark chapter 10. And this includes the state and the civil government. What God has joined together, no human power, no nation, no united nations, has the power to destroy that bond. What God has joined together, no man has the power to, to break apart. He may pretend, he may ignore the bond, but when the time comes for judgment, that bond will be every bit as much in force as it ever was, and the judgment will be based upon that bond. Number 14, what is an invalid marriage? A union that never was a marriage in the eyes of God. No matter how men might consider it, no matter how the couple themselves might consider how much they might consider themselves married. <clears throat> marriage was an institution established by God himself. And the, the couple do have a choice to make. <coughs> the man, the woman, each have a choice to decide whether to get married at all. The couple then has a choice after that to decide whom to marry. They can pick an individual to marry. But after they do that, after they marry, they are bound by the laws that God has placed in marriage. They are bound by the very nature that God gave marriage. They cannot just make it up as, as they go along or invent, invent marriage for themselves. That's no marriage at all. And so people who do marry have to accept the terms that God himself has laid down for being married. If they don't, they're making a travesty of their marriage and possibly even making it completely invalid. A couple invalidly married must either separate or have the marriage made valid. <clears throat> Otherwise, they are living in adultery or fornication. Neither fornicators nor adulterers shall possess the kingdom of God. Words of St. Paul. Actually, words of God expressed by St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 
Chapter 6. Neither fornicators nor adulterers shall possess the kingdom of God, have any place in the kingdom of God. And that, as a matter of fact, as if St. Paul anticipated the objections, he said to the Corinthians, Let no one deceive you with vain or empty words. He made it very clear that this is true. Despite all of the protests to the contrary, it remains true. Fornicators and adulterers have no place in the kingdom of God. Now, uh, when it says here that they have to separate or become validly married, how would they become validly married? Well, if a couple admits or discovers that their marriage was not valid, that they are not really married to each other in the eyes of God, if they're free to marry, if they're not refugees from some previous marriage, but they have no other marriage bond holding them, and therefore are free to marry each other, they can go and talk to a Catholic priest, a real Catholic priest, a real traditional Catholic priest, and ask him, Father, um, we married uh, invalidly outside the church, we married uh, in defiance of the church law and of God's law. We know we are not joined together in matrimony. We know we're not joined together in marriage by God. We want to be. What do we have to do to be married validly, be truly married in the eyes of God? And the priest will tell them exactly what they need to do. I mean, it's not uh, rocket science. It's actually very straightforward what needs to be done. And those who are willing to do it who realize how important it is, and who love each other enough, and love their own souls enough, and love God enough, they will do it. They will take the steps necessary to be validly married. <clears throat> Number 15, what is necessary for a valid marriage? One, a single man and a single woman. Two, who are of age. Yes, there is an age requirement, because there is a consent requirement. And because um, in order to validly give their consent, they have to have a certain maturity, a certain age. They have to be free to marry, with no other marriage bond tying them to anyone else. Fourthly, they have to be capable of sexual intercourse. <clears throat> uh, they can't be impotent in such a way that they cannot complete the marriage act. Uh, the Church realizes that uh, marrying people who are in that position well, put them in, would put them in the position of actually perverting the Marriage Act in seeking union with each other, and it would become a very sinful relationship. So the Church says, no, that's an impediment that would prevent them from marrying if they cannot even complete the Marriage Act. Number five, who intended... They have to intend to live together. In other words, they have to intend to fulfill the basic requirements of marriage. They have to accept the obligations of marriage. They have to accept the responsibilities. Why? Well, because they're giving rights to the other person. And they have to legitimately, honestly, truly, sincerely give those rights. And they have to sincerely, honestly, and truly receive the rights of the other person. And someone who intends to marry but does not intend to get the marriage rights does not intend to marry. As simple as that. So the marriage rights have to be given and have to be accepted and the responsibilities that go with them. Six, to be faithful to each other until the death of one of them. They have to intend to uh, marry as long as they both live. Now one could argue, perhaps, well, what if my husband or wife, my wife married me, intended to marry, intended me to be his wife, intended to be, a, be her husband, but they also allowed the possibility of going outside the marriage they didn't rule that out. Would that invalidate the marriage bond? No, it wouldn't necessarily, necessarily invalidate the marriage contract. Um, what you need is someone uh, to marry someone, uh, and both of them having the intention to be, come, husband and wife, as long as they both live. They intend to have a family. Now this again could be misunderstood. Sometimes you'll have people say, well, I, I don't think that woman ever validly married me. I don't think that man ever validly married me because he didn't want any children or she didn't want any children. 
Sometimes they actually had children. So there's no argument there. But the idea that someone absolutely ruled out the possibility of having children, well, that's something that, number one, has to be proven absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt that that is the case, that that is the intention they had when they made their marriage vows. But even beyond that, then that has to be judged by the authority of the church, the magisterial authority of the church. Even if somebody were to come to me and prove beyond a shadow of a doubt, to me anyway, that the person they married had absolutely ruled out the very possibility of children, I would still not have the confidence to judge whether this was true or not, and whether it made their marriage invalid. Only the competent authority of the church can make that judgment. So, and number eight, that they are in no other way prohibited by the law of God from marrying. And there are such things as dirament impediments, which would, by law of the church, and sometimes law of God, actually make the marriage vows impossible, invalidate them from the beginning, because they would just uh, just impose that, that ban of, of invalidity, usually affecting the consent, or drawing into uh, question the validity of their consent to be married. I won't go into reading off what those impediments are right now. It suffices to say that there are such impediments that the Church has the authority from Christ to impose that would render a marriage null and void. Um, some of these the Church can dispense from for a very serious reason, but rarely does she do it. But in any case, uh, these eight things are given here as necessary for a valid marriage, and we should take them to heart. Number 16, did God make these laws only for Catholics? And the answer is no. All human beings have to obey these laws of God with, regarding, with regard to marriage. It is true that Catholics have the sacrament of matri, matrimony, but even the sacrament of matrimony is built upon the foundation of the natural institution of marriage. And so pagans can marry, the non-baptized can marry, atheists can marry, they can marry as long as they have the proper intention. The, inten the essential intention is that they take each other, they give each other the marriage rights, and they give each other the marriage rights for as long as they both live. So it is not just Catholics who are bound by these laws of the indissolubility of marriage, or what we're going to talk about, the exclusivity of marriage. We'll talk about that in a moment. Number 16. Did God make these laws only for Catholics? And the answer is no. All human beings have to obey these laws. However, Catholics are also bound by church laws as well. For example, a Catholic cannot marry validly, except in the presence of a priest and two witnesses. For a uh, quote, let's see the parentheses there, unless there is a special dispensation from the bishop of the place for a particular case, and that for a sufficiently grave reason. Now, the Novus Ordo has brought in all kinds of aberrations against this, which call into question the Catholic Church's actually jurisdiction here, and even power over the sacrament of matrimony. I mean, the modern church allows her people to get married in Protestant churches in front of Protestant ministers. Mostly, they require that at least some Catholic clergyman be there from the diocese, uh, from some Novus Ordo parish, be on hand as a witness. But actually, who is leading the marriage ceremony, who is, quote-unquote, performing the marriage ceremony, often it's a Protestant minister in a Protestant church. How, what an attack this is on our Lord's words to the church that he's giving authority to the church, to Peter, to his apostles, and to those whom they ordained. Um, if the priest is simply there as an observer like everybody else, what good is he? And is he validly a priest at all? Obviously, this is another question. I understand that. But the fact is the Novus Ordo has really undermined the very meaning of the sacrament of matrimony. The Novus Ordo has gone beyond that. It has actually undermined the very meaning of marriage, even the natural institution of marriage, by all of the annulments that they're giving, thousands and thousands of annulments every year, just simply annihilating marriages, saying, well, these never were, but we know, in fact, that the 
grounds they're using are very suspect, and so they've often been referred to as Catholic divorces. An oxymoron, if ever there was one, Catholic divorces, impossible. There is no such thing. Except in the Novus Ordo, where they're willing to pretend their annulments are merely statements that this marriage was never valid, but they know that often they're just saying, okay, your first marriage didn't work out, go try another one. And this is a travesty. Um, now, moving on here, I want to uh, point out that uh, Catholics who have been involved in the Novus Ordo can't leave Pepe Valley be married there. We're not saying that the Novus Ordo marriages are all invalid. <clears throat> and why is that? Well, because the Church has taught the Church has taught that it is the married couple who confer the sacrament on each other. The priest doesn't actually confer the sacrament of matrimony on the bride and the groom. <clears throat> the priest is there, indeed, as a witness of the Church, the Catholic Church, and he presides over the marriage ceremony, which has been given into the power of the Church by Christ. <clears throat> but <clears throat> the priest has them express their vows so that they're expressing their consent to be married and what the husband is doing, the, the groom is doing by bringing his marriage vows and accepting the, wife, the bride's marriage vows and the bride by expressing her marriage vows and receiving her groom's marriage vows they are actually uniting each other they're conferring the sacrament of matrimony on each other so the question arises, uh, can a couple under any circumstances, a Catholic couple, marry under any circumstances without the presence of a priest? And the answer is yes. In the Code of Canon Law, before John Paul II put out his new Code of Canon Law for the Novus Ordo in 1983-84, but the previous Code of Canon Law of the Church acknowledges that in missionary territories where they would not expect to see a priest for a month at a time, a Catholic couple, not a couple yet, a Catholic man and a Catholic woman who are free to marry could actually summon witnesses and pronounce their marriage vows. Now obviously not everyone can do this all the time. There are very serious restrictions about this. And even after that's done, that the man and the woman publicly express their, their, their marriage vows, they mean them, and they say what needs to be said and express what needs to be expressed to be validly married before a witness who can testify to that, that they would be married. They would actually have married each other at that point. But the church still says that when a priest becomes available, when a priest is there, they should solemnize the marriage uh, with the ceremonies of the church. So um, there, are, there is that provision made traditionally in the church because of the church's understanding that um, the married couple, the marrying couple, actually confer the sacrament on each other. Now, 17, does the state have authority to change God's laws? The answer is no. The state does not have any authority over God's laws. God's law comes before man's law and actually determines man's law. God's law is so far above man's law that man's law must be conformed to the law of God, <coughs> not in contradiction to it. But the state, the civil government, can make laws requiring a license and registration, and concerning health, property rights, and so on. The state can make laws regarding the age, proper age of marriage so long as these laws are not contrary to God's laws. Remember, the state has an interest in marriage. There are two, what we call, perfect societies here on earth. Perfect in so far as they have the means necessary to achieve their, their ends, their ultimate ends. And the one perfect society is the church itself that Christ established. And the other is the civil society in which we live here on earth. And these two societies 
one natural, the other supernatural, uh, both actually come from God. It is God who himself is the origin of the authority of the state and the origin of authority in the church. <clears throat> so whether you're talking about church society, ecclesiastical society, you're talking about uh, <clears throat> natural society and the state, civil society, all authority comes from God. And so the state itself cannot rise up and say, we're going to contradict God, we're going to contradict the church of God, and make our own laws that are against God's law. The state has no right to do that from anyone. And uh, so even state laws must conform to God's law, church law, but the state does have, does have an interest in the marriage. Why? Because the marriage is the foundation of the family and the seedbed of all the lives that are going to live within that civil society, within that city, within that state, within that nation, within the, in the, the whole world. In other words, the state does have an interest in securing strong and proper families and good families. And the state does have the right from God to make laws governing marriage insofar as the civil society numbers the, the lives that come from those marriages. So the, the basic society of the family is the foundation for the society of the church and the society of man here on earth, the civil society at one and the same time. Number 18. Can man and woman find real happiness in marriage? Well, yes, they can, certainly. But only if they follow God's plan for marriage. Insofar as they say, well, we have our own plan, or we have our own idea of what marriage should be, and it is contrary to what God intends, then they are going to find that they will have made their lives absolutely miserable. And this can be understood very easily by realizing that when you love someone, you give them great power over you. Um, I mean, you let somebody, in a sense, into your heart, even into your soul, as it were. Someone you trust, someone you love, can do you a great deal of good, can make you be very happy. Someone you love can make you extremely happy. It's like a foretaste of the happiness of heaven when you have the, the amor benevolentiae, the, the love, the well-wishing love of someone dear to you whom you respect and whom you yourself love. But just as someone who loves you has great power to make you happy, they also have the great power to make you very, very sad. Just as they have a great power to hurt you and be a blessing to you, so they also have a great power to, to hurt you and to be a kind of curse in your life. <clears throat> when you give somebody this power and you make it permanent in marriage, that you make a marriage commitment before God and here on earth before men, you make a commitment to love this person and to do what love requires for them as long as you both live, that's a great commitment. And when you have someone come into your life who is <clears throat> a permanent member of your life and part of your life, and uh, you have obligations to them, you give them, as it were, the key to your heart. So again, they have access and they can do great good or great evil to you. Be sure you marry the right person. Be sure of the person you marry. You trust them. Make sure they're trustworthy. And so a man and a woman who marry someone worthy of being loved and someone who truly loves them, a man and a woman who marry someone, a spouse, who loves God with a, the, the supreme love and loves them as they should, as a husband and a wife, devotedly, would be the happiest person on earth. No matter what hardships they have to endure, 
They can be the happiest persons on earth and they can be very strong together. Um, but if they marry the wrong person, they are quite the opposite. Corruptio ultima pessima, the corruption of the best thing, is the worst corruption of all. So when marriage and matrimony, because they are so exalted and so beautiful, when they, as good as they are, are corrupted, they become very bad indeed. And so there are many people uh, in the world who may lament the fact that they're not married when they want to be married. <clears throat> but there is a situation that is much worse than not being married when you want to be married, and that is being married when you don't want to be married. When you marry the wrong person, you're really in trouble. Uh, there is no greater threat to your earthly happiness and peace and to your eternal salvation than marrying the wrong person. So be very, very careful, please, when you do that. Pray a great deal about them and for them. Now, number 19, what is the greatest source of happiness in marriage? The greatest source of happiness really is serving God. <clears throat> Serving God by giving him life and fulfilling his command when he said increase multiply and fill the earth So that when you bring children to the world and you raise them in the holy fear and love of God That is the source of greatest joy to God fearing and God loving parents and the greatest heartache to them is when they see their children not fearing God with a just and uh, holy fear, a respectful fear of God, and not loving God, but being very selfish, self-centered, self-serving. This is a great sorrow for parents. The parents, you have a kind of formula to follow in order to raise children who love God. And it starts with you. They have to learn from you the meaning of love, and they have to learn from you what it is to love God. One of the most important things you have to teach them is gratitude, to be grateful. They have to learn what it is to be grateful, to appreciate. And uh, if they don't appreciate anything, they can't use it well. They don't enjoy anything. All they're thinking about all the time is what they don't have, not appreciating what they do. And if they don't appreciate anything, they're certainly not going to be thankful for it. All the saints in heaven are continually thanking God. Why? Because gratitude is this expression of a happy and blessed soul. They are gra grateful because they rejoice in, in goods that they could not possibly have earned for themselves. They are rejoicing in the gifts of God, and they are so happy, made so happy by them, that gratitude is an expression of their happiness in heaven. <clears throat> but when you find you're raising children on earth, who uh, don't take care of what they have, don't appreciate it, don't give thanks for it at all, but are constantly complaining about what they don't have and obsessing about what they want that they can't have, you're in trouble. And you need to think, what can we do now in order to raise our children in the holy fear of God and in His love? What can we do to raise our children to be grateful? If, they don't, if they're not grateful, they're never happy. You never meet someone who's grateful who's miserable, and you never meet somebody who's miserable who's grateful. So, um, don't have miserable children. We have grateful children. Now, they give you the practical points here. First, all laws, both human and divine, are made for the good of society. Once in a while, a law will work a hardship on an individual and this is sometimes true of God's law and marriage, too. But you marry, quote, for better or for worse. Therefore, if through no fault of yours, your married life is unhappy for you, or if your partner has left you, or if you find God's laws hard to observe, ask God for the strength to do his will. Ask your crucified Savior for the courage to carry your cross bravely and lovingly for him, who carried his cross so lovingly and patiently for you. 
The sacrament of matrimony gives married couples special graces to live their lives according to God's laws. In any case, God made no exceptions to his laws on marriage. To break them for any reason is a mortal sin. And this brings up the fact that marriage is a vocation. The vocation is a calling from God, but it's also a life of service. And everyone has, everyone has a life of service to render God. That's what his life is for. A life of service is not an easy life. A life of service is not uh, simply self-satisfying for the sake of, of simply taking it easy and enjoying oneself. People think, seem to think that way selfishly, that it's my life and I'm here to enjoy myself, and that's all that matters. But those who see there is a God, and they are creatures of that God, and God made their souls in his image and likeness. God gave them the great gift of life and preserved their life until this moment. And those who realize that accept the responsibility for it. They see this is a great gift, but it's not given just merely for the sake of my own personal enjoyment and amusement. My life has much more meaning than that. It is meant, it is meant to be a service to God and accomplish great things for him. And so that means that there are going to be sacrifices. Every vocation, every life of service is going to be a life of sacrifice. Is a life of sacrifice a sad life? Well, it is if someone doesn't love anyone. <clears throat> I mean, having to make sacrifices for something or someone you don't love, sure, that's sad. But if sacrifices are made out of love for someone, well, those sacrifices not only are tolerable, they're actually joyful. <clears throat> How many times... The husband or wife, or even courtship, courtship, a, a, a fiancé. How many times do they not go out of their way, using their own time and energies and resources and money and whatever, sacrificing them for the sake of doing something that will delight the one they love? And the delight of the one they love is more than worth all the sacrifice they made. They're just so happy. They rejoice so much to see the one they love rejoicing at what they've done. And so pleased by what they've done for them. They forget all the sacrifice they've made because the reward is so great. Well, that is how God is with us. He, he rejoices in what we are willing to do for him, even the little things. Our Lord even said, if you give so much as a cup of cold water to a little one in his name, for his sake, you will not lose your reward. God is so great, he keeps track of all that. Well, if in your vocation, not just giving a drink of water, which mothers and fathers do to their children all the time, um... But if they fulfill all the other duties of their state in life as mothers and fathers, husbands and wives, imagine all the wonderful things they have to, to render to God, the services they render to God in taking care of each other, in taking care of their children. This is what real happiness is. This is real joy here. Those who cannot make this commitment and will not make those sacrifices can know no joy because they have accomplished nothing with their lives. They haven't been able to commit themselves and therefore to render the sacrifices that are, in de that are simply part and parcel to a life of service. And in the end, they have nothing to show for life. At least nothing good to show for it. And there's no joy in that. No wonder there's no self-respect in the young people today, in so many cases, because they have nothing to show for their lives. Their lives have been nothing but taking, 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 taking. Do for me, do for me, do for me. That's all you think about. Everyone has to do for them. And give and give and give to them. But that means that they have no... nothing that they've accomplished with their life. And that lack of accomplishment is very depressing for young people but they've never been required to accomplish. And that's very sad for them. Well, when they grow up, if they do hopefully grow up and they marry, they have to understand then, perhaps for the first time, what it is to be entering a vocation that is a life of service to Almighty God. 
to a husband or a wife, to children. And they're not just there to satisfy themselves, merely satisfy themselves. Well, unfortunately, many of the so-called marriages today are built upon the, that shallowness. But we have to teach our young people their true dignity, the purpose of their lives, the vocation of being married, and what it is to accomplish, and how grand and glorious it is, because of all the virtues needed for it, and all the wonders that can be accomplished, not only in bringing children to the world, but also in sanctifying the souls of the mother, the father, the husband, and the wife. It's a life of service. And service requires sacrifice, and sacrifice and love is joyful. Now, number two, do not try to judge whether your marriage or anybody else's is valid or invalid. That can be done only by one who is skilled in the knowledge of these laws. Now, wait a minute. I think they're selling us short here. The judgment of whether a marriage is valid or invalid does not in, is not a, up to someone who is skilled in the knowledge of these laws. The judgment of whether a marriage is valid is an exercise of the authority that Christ gave to his church. A theologian, one is very skilled in these matters, could render an opinion. But that opinion, in the end, isn't going to matter one bit. You can't go simply on the basis of opinion, somebody's opinion, whether you were validly married or not. Only when you have the magisterial of the Catholic Church, the magisterial authority of the Catholic Church pronouncing authoritatively that this marriage was valid or invalid, can you actually stake your soul's salvation on that answer. That's the problem we have with the Novus Ordo, though, because they're abusing that so badly, falsifying the meaning of marriage and declaring null and void marriages that clearly were not null and void for reasons that the Church never allowed as justifications for annulments. <clears throat> and so the very least you can say about the Novus Ergo marriage annulments is that they are very suspect, completely unreliable, and you cannot risk your soul salvation on any of them. <clears throat> they tell you here, the priest who is instructing you will tell you whether your marriage is valid or not. Well, again, I mean, it's not up to the individual priest, it's up to the Church. You know, uh, in the former days, before the Novus Ordo came in, I mean, you, you would contact the, the priest, the priest would then get the necessary information together and contact the bishop, and the, that would be referred to Rome, the, the sacred Roman rota. And the supreme authority of the church would judge marriages around the world and their validity. But only after investigating them with very competent authority, very competent uh, scholars who are moral theologians and sacramental theologians who would take interviews under oath and get uh, certain certain proof that there was grounds where the marriage was invalid. It's not up to any individual priest to grant someone a marriage annulment anymore. That's, that's absurd. Number three, an annulment is not the dissolving of an existing marriage but rather a declaration that a real marriage never existed in the eyes of God. On account of some dire defect or impediment that was present at the time the couple exchanged their vows. For example, if one of the two parties did not intend to enter a permanent union that lasted until death, then no marriage would take place despite the fact that all appeared to be well. But if interiorly he's withholding his consent to marry for life, then that would render his, his consent to marriage or her consent to marriage null and void. And again, there would be a putative marriage, but God would know that there was no real consent and therefore there's no real marriage. An annulment is more properly termed a declaration of nullity because now we're getting to it, it requires a declaration. And that has to be declared by the supreme authority of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, the reliable supreme authority of the Roman Catholic Church, certainly not by the Novus Ordo, which is turning out tens of thousands of marriage annulments every single year. And on the, on the flimsiest, most fantastic grounds that the Church never recognized before. 
Now, one thing I didn't mention about the marriage bond, uh, we get into the next chapter, lesson, lesson 30, is uh, not only the violation of the permanence of the marriage vow, the indissolubility of the marriage vows, but the exclusive nature of the bond, such that a man or a woman who marries must never have any romantic thoughts about another person outside the marriage. That the marriage bond requires that the love and the loyalty of the spouse be directed to his or her spouse exclusively. <clears throat> that any romantic thoughts must be directed toward one's spouse. If those romantic thoughts are directed to a person outside the marriage, you have immediately a sin against the marriage bond. You have a mortal sin where it is fully consented to and a person is, is actually indulging in romantic thoughts, having a romantic relationship with someone else. <coughs> and that is not only true if they're thinking in terms of a physical relationship, but I, even, even the, the other things involved in marriage, living with another person, again, a romantic relationship with another person. is a violation of the, the marriage vows, an ex the exclusive, exclusive nature of the marriage vows. And we find in our society today that this idea of having romances outside the marriage bond is not only an exception, it's a norm, practically speaking, especially in corporate America today, where the man and the woman, who are not married to each other, but are married to other people, but the man and the woman are working for the same firm in the same office, day after day, hour after hour, looking their professional best, all done up. They may go home and find their wives and curlers and all the rest with the mud pack on, but they never see the young gal in the cubicle next to them like that. She's always very nicely coiffed and very made up. And so, spending hours and hours like that, and, and the gentleman, too, if he is a gentleman, Yes, okay. I mean, he, he can look like a ruffian after he's been at home uh, working out or doing various things. But when he's in the office there, he's all nicely done, and his hair is combed, and he looks really sharp, and he's on his, well, good behavior, if he has good behavior. And so they really don't see each other for better or for worse. They only see each other at their professional best. No wonder that the, the romance begins to act on them. No wonder that the devil gets in there and tries to draw them to each other. They start noticing things about each other they find attractive. They cannot allow that to happen. They must not allow that to happen. They have to control their thoughts or get out of that job. They have to get away from each other, stay away from each other. If this is what's happening and they find that this is becoming a challenge to their marriage vows and that exclusive romantic relationship with their husband and their wife, they have to fight for their marriage vows. They have to fight for their souls. They have to fight for the souls of their their, their wives, their husbands, their children. Because if they don't, and they get drawn into this emotional relationship, romantic relationship, it will destroy everything. Everything. The scandal and the, the consequences are just like a nuclear, a nuclear bomb blast in the lives of these people. They will have to learn to fight for their, the fulfillment of their marriage vows, what they promised in their marriage vows. They have to fight for that because the devil hates true love. The devil hates true love. He tries to destroy it wherever he finds it. Why does Satan hate true love? Because he doesn't understand it. He doesn't have it. The only thing he knows is selfishness. And whatever else exists, and whoever else exists, he sees as there to serve his own personal pride. That's not love. But not only can't the devil see it, can't he understand it, he can't control it. And it's constantly angering him. He's angry that God would send his son to redeem us. The love of God for us to him is an absolute mystery. He can't understand it, it makes no sense at all. To him it is absurd. 
Why would God love them? But God does, and it drives Satan mad. <laughs> and not only that, there's the other side of the question too. Satan works and works and works and works and works on souls to corrupt them. And he thinks he's got them firmly in his grasp. And then just when he thinks there's no escape and they're crushed and they're totally in his power, he opens his hand and they're not there. They're gone. What happened? Well, he knows what happened. They made an act of love for God. God gave them a grace to repent of their sins out of love for God. And God forgave them, either by a perfect act of contrition with perfect love, or through the power of the cross of Jesus Christ our Lord, working through the sacrament of penance, that God forgives. Satan never forgives. He doesn't know the meaning of the word. Look at Judas. Judas sinned. He offended God gravely by betraying our Lord. Could he ask for forgiveness? No. Did I ever cross his mind? I don't think so. He went and hung himself. He was probably a very unforgiving person. A kind of person who didn't even know the meaning of forgiveness. He couldn't seek forgiveness either. He wouldn't if he had the chance even. He wouldn't lower himself. He'd rather kill himself. So it was with Lucifer. Rather than submit, he would defy and go to hell. But he would not submit. So Satan hates true love. If a couple marries, Satan is in their, his sights. They, have, they are in Satan's sights. And they're not going to escape temptation. If a married couple escape temptation, then the devil is failing himself. <laughs> He's letting himself down. I mean, Satan... It's a matter of his dishonor, as it were, to tempt and to try to destroy true love wherever he finds it. And so he'll try to corrupt it. He'll try to pervert it. The temptations will be there. You have to count on that when you get married. So you have to fight for that love. You have to fight for the integrity of your marriage vows. The integrity of your marriage vows. And you cannot allow yourself to be maneuvered into a situation where you are going to be tempted against the allegiance to this one man, this one woman, an allegiance that you promised to Almighty God. So, actually, we're, we're nibbling at the edges here of the question of women in the workplace. I know, uh, you know, women want careers, they want advancement in the companies and money of their own and so on, travel and all the rest. And the problem with that is not that uh, women can't do the job. Very often they really can. I mean, I, I know so many women myself, and I'm sure you do too, who are very, very competent. Um, and uh, women, by their gender, have certain talents that come easier, more easily to them than they do to men. Men by their gender have certain traits that fit and make it easier for them to accomplish certain tasks. But that doesn't mean that men cannot learn to accomplish tasks that women do more easily, and that women cannot uh, uh, learn to accomplish tasks that men do normally more easily. And they, they are able to do that because of, they work hard and they succeed, because then they have the native intelligence to do it. So, you know, women can do intellectually, mentally, very wonderful work. They can. That's not the issue of what they're capable of doing. <clears throat> or not capable of doing so much. Um, now when we get to fighting on the front lines in a war, that's a different question. A physical work. Physically, they're very different. We know that. Okay, The physical powers. I'm not talking about that right now. I'm not even talking about that issue. I'm talking about men who have to raise their children and the children do not have moms at home. Dad has to be able to adjust, and God will give him the grace to be able to do a good job for those children and give those children what they need. And moms who have to raise the children with the dad, dead or absent, God gives them the grace to be able to do what their children and give their children what they need. Again, God will by grace supply that. 
So the question is this, though, that in our society today, have we not thrown promiscuously men and women together and spent them spend hours together, sometimes having lunch and dinners together, sometimes traveling together, and they're not married to each other, they're each married to somebody else. Are we not putting them in harm's way? Are we not putting them on the train tracks and just waiting for the train to come by? Are we not leading them into temptation? And why are we doing that? The promiscuous mixing of the genders in the workplace is an evil because it puts them in temptation. And so no wonder, some years ago, there was actually talk, open talk, about, yes, I have my wife at home, but I have my work wife. Yes, I have my husband at home, but I also have my work husband. What's that? It's a corruption. Total corruption. So when people marry these days, one has to prepare them for that battle. To fight, to guard the exclusive relationship the giving of their heart to this other human being and promise to God that they will be faithful and that they must not allow themselves even to fantasize about a romantic relationship with anyone else because what they do, allow themselves to fantasize even about a romantic relationship with anybody else, they're already taking the first big step toward the destruction of themselves, their spouses, their families, and the happy, whatever happy married family life they could possibly have. And they're setting, setting, they're beginning to set the stage for a disaster. So remember the two properties of marriage and matrimony is a sacrament. The property of indissolubility that the marriage bond lasts as long as they both live. And nothing can break that bond and that responsibility that comes from it. Because God will judge them on the basis of that requirement, that bond, that obligation. And also the property of exclusivity or unicity, as it is called sometimes, where there's that unique relationship between the husband and the wife, mutually, so that their romantic involvement with each other, thinking of this man and this woman as their husband, as their wife, and all that that implies, is absolutely directed to their spouses only. It's an exclusive relationship, rules out absolutely anyone else being involved in that. Not even a thought allowed or tolerated about a romantic relationship with anyone else. Well, that's enough for, for now. We'll come back to this question when we go on to Lesson 30, I guess it is, on sins against the marriage vows. Well, may God bless you.